In this tutorial, I'll demonstrate how to use the new user interface for Animatlab 2. There are some pretty significant differences in how you use the system. So if you just try and start it up and go, you may feel a little lost at first. I'll start by loading up one of the old example tutorials that was included in Animatlab 1, the belly flopper simulation. One of the nice things about Animatlab 2 is that you can now just double click on your project files to open up a simulation. When you load up an old project file, it pops up a dialog telling you that you must convert the project to be able to use it. Select the Yes button and it begins the conversion process. Once it's done, it lets you know and asks you if you'd like to load it. Once you hit the Yes button, it attempts to load the project. While the project is loading, you can look at the bottom status bar to see what it's currently processing. When a project is first converted, you'll see several collapsed docking panes. These panes should be familiar to you from version 1. The main one is the workspace. In version 1, each window had its own hierarchy and properties panes. This was changed for the new version. Now, there's only one workspace, property, and toolbar pane for the entire application so all simulation items can be accessed through this primary workspace. The Properties pane shows you the properties for the selected items in the workspace. The Toolbox gives you access to the neural items that can be added to your behavioral editors. You can just drag and drop items onto your various behavioral subsystems like you normally could in version 1. There are also three docking panes that are related to receptive fields. The first allows you to associate points on a rigid body with neurons within that organism. The second allows you to set the receptive field gain, and the third allows you to set the receptive field current. The final two toolbars are the simulation control toolbar and the error bar that gives you some helpful warnings when things are not connected up properly in your simulation. When a project is converted, these panes are minimized by default. You can dock them by pinning them to the, into the window. You do this by clicking the little pin button that pins it right there. But then you can move it wherever you want by simply grabbing onto the title bar and moving it. When you do, these icons are shown and if you place your uh, mouse over them, it will show you where the, the new window will be located if you drop it there. So let's drop it right here. So basically we've moved this to the right hand side of the window. You configure these however you want them and then save the project. The next time you open the project, the windows will come up in that configuration again. I'm going to go ahead and set this workspace up to be over on the left hand side. and I'm going to put the properties bar underneath it. So you can stack these and put them on top of each other however you want. So for instance let's get the toolbar and put it right there. So now we have whoops, have the workspace and toolbar on top of each other with tabs and our properties below it. Another big change in version 2 is that there's no longer a separate simulation window. You can now have numerous views of the simulated world and look at them all at the same time. Let's start by opening up a window to view the belly flopper organism. You do this just like in the old version by double clicking on the body plane of that organism. This opens up a simulated world showing the organism in the ground. One thing to note is that the mouse controls for moving around in the simulated world have changed. We're using a standard OSG manipulator now, so to zoom in and out, you hold down the right mouse button and drag the mouse. To rotate, you hold down the left mouse button and drag the mouse. And to pan, you hold down the middle mouse button and drag. However, panning won't work right now because you're set to track an object. This window is currently set to track the belly flopper organism. You can see this up in the toolbar. The structure is set to belly flopper and the body part is set to body. You can change this to track whatever you want or to track nothing. 
When you set it to no tracking, then you can move freely within the space. This is so we can pan however we want, rotate, and change our view to put it wherever we want. So you can just move around in the environment to wherever position you want. Let's go ahead and, and uh, leave this one open, and then we're going to open up another window to see the, to track the belly flopper up and place those windows side by side. So let's open up another editor for the belly flopper and move it so that they're side by side. And you can operate these windows completely independent of each other to, to, to see different parts of the simulation at the same time. So now to run the simulation, you just click the play button. So I'll go ahead and close this one that's got no tracking on it because we don't really need it at this point. I just wanted to demonstrate that how you could do that. Another thing that's changed in version 2 is how, that, is how you uh, move and rotate parts with the mouse. So you can select a part either through the workspace or by clicking on it in the environment. When you do, you'll see this drag handler come up. This has an axis for each of the X, Y, and Z that allows you to drag the object and circles on each of the axes that allows you to rotate. So let's say we want to move this guy up a little, over, and we'll rotate him this way, rotate that way. So that allows you to move these various parts however you want. One cool thing in Animate Lab 2 now is that you have the ability to set the orientation of any of your your structures or organisms as well as place it in a position. You didn't have this ability in, in version 1. You could just specify where you wanted it but not what its orientation would be. So now you have that capability. So if we play this, ah, he falls. Okay. So let's uh, go ahead and set him back. There we go. Another change from Animat Lab 1 is the idea of graphical versus collision objects. In version 1, when you added a box, you had a box of the exact same dimensions that would show up in the simulation. There was no way to change this. In version 2, the item that is displayed in the simulation doesn't necessarily have to have any direct relationship to the part that's used for the dynamics. This is useful in that you can have a complex mess for your visual part that has no dynamics, and you can have several static rigid bodies that make up that part. To demonstrate this, let's create a new kitchen table structure. We'll go ahead and get a mesh for this table structure and use that for our visuals. Two sites that I like for finding free meshes on is Archive3D-Net and TurboSquid.com. So let's go ahead and try Archive.net or 3D.net. This looks like a pretty good one. One of the nice things about the version 2 now is that you no longer are restricted to just using OBJ and ASC files for your meshes. You can use pretty much anything that you can download off the internet. This particular one has a 3DS model type.
copy the pieces. Let's create a new table folder. Let me paste them in there. Okay. Now, on our table, let's right click and say add root body. So another big change in version 2 is how you add body parts and joints. Before, you just had a couple of drop downs that let you select the default parts. Instead, now you click the add body button on the toolbar, and then you click where you want to add the part. This will open the add body part dialog that lets you select the type of body you want to add and some basic properties. Uh, there's two different ways of doing it. One, you can select the, the structure like we just did and right click and select add root body. Or you can open up the body plan for that one, and it will not have any body parts for that part and for that structure in it yet. And then you click the, the add uh, part toolbar button, and it will do the same thing. From that point on, though, you just click the add um, body part toolbar button, and then click wherever you want, and it'll add it to whatever structure that you select onto. So. Some of the things that you can, uh, some of the properties that you can set in this is that you can pick the type of part you want, and you'll notice there are a few different new parts in here. There's an ellipsoid and a uh, torus. Then you have some of your basic ones sphere, mesh, cone, cylinder, and a terrain, and a fluid and a regular ground plane. For each of those, you can select whether you want it to be a collision object or a graphics object. And if it's a collision object, you can select whether you want it to have a default graphics or not. And you can also select whether you want this to be a sensor object or not. A sensor just detects when it collides with other parts, but it has no dynamics of itself otherwise. For this particular one, since it's the root body part, you no longer you don't have those options. It has to be a collision object, and you can only choose whether you want a default graphics or not. In this case, we want to click the box, and we want to have no default graphics. Let's move this guy a little bit out and change our tracking to look at him. Okay. So next we want to add our graphical mesh. So let's go ahead and click the add body part and click on our table surface and we're going to add a mesh we're going to make it a graphics object and OK. Since this is a mesh object it next asks you for the location of the mesh file so we're going to go into our table and click our table 3ds and load it in. One of the things with meshes that you'll find is that they almost always are loaded way too big and uh, way far away so uh, one of the first things I always do when I load a mesh is just go in and, and scale it way down. And then move the position of it so that it's in line. Okay, and you can notice that this time it's also uh, oriented badly. So let's do about. Oops, I'm doing. Oh, wrong way. Negative 90. There we go. And then we want. With that. There we go. So now it looks like it's lined up correctly. 
So now let's move it down a little bit. Okay. So what I'm trying to do is right now is to get this collision mesh in line with the surface of this guy. Okay, that's good. There we go. Now let's decrease the height just a little bit. Okay. Okay, that looks pretty good. Now let's uh, add this texture back onto our table so it actually looks like a table. So go ahead and add this wood texture that we brought in, and now you can see it looks like a wood table. Now let's move our table surface up so it's on the floor. So. Raise a little too much. There, 77 looks good. Now let's move this guy over just a little bit. Oops, wrong way. There we go. Now our belly flopper is directly in line with the uh, the leg of the table. Let's go ahead and freeze freeze our table surface so that it'll stay where it is. Another new feature in version two is the ability to add lights. This gives you more control of how your scene looks. If you click on light one, then go to the simulation editor and zoom way out, you can see the light source that was selected. To see its effects, let's change its world position. So when we moved it, we can see that the light was no longer over here, so it got darker. Now it lets us see the outlines of the table a little bit better. You can control the light using the attenuation settings. So for light 2 we have it set to a constant attenuation. Constant attenuation between 0 and 1 will affect the ambient lighting. However, at 0 1 it gets turned off. So if we select light 2, we can change it. Let's go ahead and change it to 0 0.3. And you can see how things got a little lighter there. I'll set that back to point 0.9. Okay. And for light one, it has a quadratic distance attenuation. So the further away you get from the light, the intensity of the light decreases quadratically. So to make the light stronger, we want to make this number bigger. So let's make it 200. Oh, 200 millimeter, 200 meters, not. You can see how it starts washing stuff out. Okay. So now let's go ahead and uh, run our simulation. 
Let's see what happens. So we can see that even though we have a graphics part here and it has the table surface, we have no collisions right here. So the belly flopper is able to just go straight through it. It doesn't even see it. So to get around that, let's go ahead and add some legs. So go ahead and click the add button. Let's use a box, collision object, no, grief, no graphics object. Okay. Then now the next thing, since this is not a root part, it comes up and asks you, and it is a collision part, it asks you what type of joint you want. We have all the basic standard ones that were in version 1, the ball and socket, hinge, prismatic, and universal. Uh, there's also a, a few new ones now. The free joint allows you to have parts that are not restricted in movement in any way. So one thing this uh, is useful for is like if you want to make a, a chain link, you can have two torus objects that are inter, uh, interlaced with each other, and uh, it's just the collisions that keep them from moving apart kind of thing. Another one is the distance. This doesn't restrict the rotations at all, and it just restricts the movement of the part based on it doesn't allow it to go past a certain distance. The RPRO stands for Relative Position Relative Orientation. This is actually the joint that was used for static joints in version 1. However, we now have a static joint that's slightly different. All What it does is instead of actually having a joint, it just combines the, the collision geometries into one piece. This is good in that it reduces the calculations that are needed, so it no longer has to do the calculations for a joint. So it's much faster and much more stable, and uh, one of the problems you had in version 1 sometimes is that with static joints, you could actually get them to move uh, if you put too much force on them. That's not going to happen with the new static joint. However, one thing about the new static joint is that you can't add static parts to other static parts. So if you add a static piece, then it has to be to another uh, root collision object. If you do this through the editor, it's done automatically. But when you convert a project, it's converted using this RPRO uh, when you had an old static one. And that's because you could, in the old version, you could have hierarchies of static objects, which you can't do anymore. So for this particular one, we're going to click the static joint. Leg one. Let's see, let's set it to be equal position.
There we go. We can just see the very bottom of the, the leg there. Okay. Let's copy this guy. Paste. So what was this one? Forty two, forty, forty one. Okay. Now let's run the simulation again. However, one problem is that we now see the collision objects and the table, but we really only want to see the table while the simulation is running. So let's fix this. Let's stop the simulation and go back to the table collision objects. Find the transparency section within the properties. This is a new feature for version 2. There are now several different viewing modes for looking at the virtual world. You can switch between these manually using the toolbar of the menu or when you select the different part types. If you go to the toolbar, you can hover, hover over these icons and they can tell you what view mode they control.
The first mode is uh, selecting graphics objects only. The next is collision objects, then joints, rep uh, receptive fields, and then finally it's simulation mode. While you're in a given mode, you can only select parts of that type. So if you're in joint mode, you only select joints. Also, every part has a transparency setting used for that mode. This lets you have com uh, complete control of how you want to see things within that view mode. For our table part, let's set the transparency for the simulation mode to 100. That one was already set to 100, so let's set all the legs to also be 100. This means that when the simulation is running, that the uh, collision objects are completely transparent. However, while it's in collision mode, we want it to, uh, to be fully visible. But when we're viewing in graphics mode, we want it to be 50% transparent. Now let's run the simulation again. You can see that when we're in uh, collision mode, we can see the collision objects. But when we switch to uh, the uh, graphics mode, they're slightly transparent. And when we start the simulation, we don't see them at all anymore. This will work with all objects within the simulation. One problem with version 1 was that it was not possible to see joints while the simulation was playing. This is no longer true. Let's set this to actually look at the belly flopper. And look here at this part. Let's set it in simulation mode to be eighty. In simulation mode, I set the uh, the body parts to be uh, pretty much transparent, so you can see the joint. And you can actually see the little flap that shows you how the joint's moving. So now, within uh, simulation mode, or within any any of the other modes, you can actually see the joints and how they move uh, within version two of Animal Lab. Let's set this guy back.
So when you select different types of parts, the view automatically changes. So when we select a rigid body part that's a collision object, we switch into collision mode. If we select a joint, we switch into joint mode where we can see the joints. And if we select a graphics object, we switch into graphics mode where we more clearly see and can select the graphics objects. We can also switch this directly by just clicking on the toolbar. Except for simulation mode. The only way to get into simulation mode is to start the simulation. Now let's go ahead and grab our organism. Let's place it on top of our table. Run the simulation. Ah! So it falls off and it still is able to keep going. Now let's go ahead and move our organism back. Now let's uh, select our table surface and freeze it. Let's move the whole thing into the air. And we can drop it. We also have the uh, the same mouse spring as before. Use the same key combinations uh, to get the the mouse spring to work. Use the Control Shift and the left uh, left mouse button. Let's go ahead and move our table back onto the ground here. Okay. So another new uh, nice feature in version 2 is that you have far more control over the parts look and feel. For example, I really don't like this floor texture. I want it to look more like a kitchen. So let's go ahead and go to the internet and Google for texture floor tile. Okay, I kind of like this one. Okay, so that adds the tile to the floor but it, it looks really bad in that it was just one single tile for the whole floor another thing to notice is that we're using a JPEG here so you can basically use almost any type of image file that you want here you're not limited to BMPs of a specific size like you were before so in, and in also in version 1 you would have been stuck with this floor tile there's no you had no control really over a, making any other setting here it would have just looked wrong however in version 2 you're not stuck with that so let's go ahead and fix it let's go to the segment length and let's set this guy to 10 10 and voila we have a tiled floor uh, you can also 
then just reset the size of the floor itself. So let's say we want a 15. And 15 by 15 to keep those one by one and we can do that so that we can set the, the size of our floor however we want and tile it however we want. You have this type of control for any of the objects. For example even with the standard shapes let's say let's go into the here and select this uh, body part. Go in here, and so we have the standard height, length, and width, but we also have sections. So let's say we want length to be split into four sections and width to be split into four sections, and you can see how it splits it up here. So if you wanted to put a tiled pattern on this, you can as well. Also, this is uh, how receptive fields are done now, so you can split this body up into however many sections you want and then pick the individual points along here. Another new feature within uh, version 2 is the more control over the color. So for instance, before you just had one color. Now we have ambient, diffuse, uh, specular, and a shininess um, variables to control your color and how it interacts with the light. So for instance, ambient is going to determine how much uh, light it puts out on its own. In other words, does it glow? Diffuse is what we normally think of as, as color, so when a white light hits it, it's telling you which what light it's going to be reflected back. Specular is, uh, say you've got a bright, shiny light on it, it's going to tell you what kind of uh, uh, the inner glow is going to look like, kind of thing. Shininess just gives you an idea of, of uh, how shiny the object is. So you can set these things and control how it interacts with the various lightings, uh, lightings within your uh, uh, your scene. So this is the main main changes that were were taking place within the the body editor portion. There are also a number of changes that are that and how you deal with the behavioral system. Not as many, but there are some. So for instance, one of them used to you would open the body editor and view the different tabs within it. Now each of these tabs can be opened separately. So you basically double click on a neural subsystem and it comes up. And just like before, you can split these up in any way you want. So now let's say if I want to go into this one, it's going to open another one. So I can split these tabs up completely separately now and have them anywhere I want so that you can view multiple uh, subsystems all at the same time that are within the same organism and copy back and forth that kind of thing and then you can split these up however you want them and save them out and they'll come back up in that in that same way the, it's got the same standard toolbar items for organizing and, and uh, the shapes that you had before up here and just as before you got your toolbox you can just drag and drop stuff onto it you can drag to add neurons and things like that and uh, synaptic connections. Another change in the neural editor is how neurons and synapses are shown in the workspace. It was really somewhat confusing before, but hopefully this new scheme will be a le little easier to understand. Go back to the workspace and look at this. All neurons and synapses are underneath a neural subsystem. You have to have a root neural subsystem and everything else that's underneath it. So if we look at for instance this guy you've got the neuron and then underneath that neuron you have all of the all, a list of all the connections that come into that neuron so in other words it has a list of all postsynaptic connections and you can see that as I select it so but uh, things that are outgoing from that neuron are shown as postsynaptic connections to the thing it goes into which in this case would be this adapter so you know the the synapses are only in the list of here once and it would always be underneath whatever it's connecting into so there is one last thing that I actually did forget to talk about as far as the body plan editor this is the materials table so in Animat Lab version 1 you had no real control over materials that were interacting with each other this is different in version 2 you now have complete control over that you can set things like the primary uh, friction coefficient, secondary friction coefficient, the slide, which this is just a, a parameter that describes how things interact 
Oh, sorry. Slip is more is more important. This is the tangential loss at the contact position. So typically you would want some kind of a slide or a slip there. Slide is like a conveyor belt. You can set the maximum forces that will be generated by the uh, frictions. You can also set an adhesive force uh, that it would have to overcome to be able to move. This is done so all simulations start with a default material and that's what they all get added to them and then you can add new materials. So when you add a new material, let's go in here, name it ice. So we're going to make it an ice. So this creates a grid here. So each new material has to be able to interact with every other material. So you have to specify what these material pair properties are for each interaction. So ice on ice, let's say it has a friction of 0 0.001 primary and secondary at 0 0.0001. So it's going to have almost no friction at all. Uh, default in ice, let's say 0 0.1 0 0.01. So it's going to have very low. But then default on default is going to have 1 and 1. Okay, so this is going to let you set the material types for different things. So for instance, you could have two planes that are in here that are just slightly uh, offset. One of them has a default material type. The other one has an ice material type. Actually, a better example would be uh, if you had a terrain and it had a, a dip in it and you could actually have a, an ice plane that goes across that dip which would be your frozen lake and so you could be walking along the terrain and then you get on the, the ice and slide so once you've created your new material let's go ahead and select the, select the ground then you go to material type all the rigid body parts have material types now and we're going to select ice this time. Okay, I'm going to set the uh, mouse spring to that. Okay, let's change default to ice. Let's decrease this even more. Okay, if we start the simulation up again, 
You can see he barely makes any headway at all. If you pull on him, he slips and slides over the ice. We go back here. Oops, sorry. Select this, change this material type back to default. And once again, he can keep going on his way. The next thing I'd like to talk about is how to plot data. This really hasn't changed that much in version 2. Let's scroll down on the workspace tree to the tool viewers. And then let's create a new tool view, add a line chart. Then you can add items to the axis. So these properties are, are the way you add the items and the properties of them are basically the same as in version one, so I'm not really going to spend very much time with those. Uh, discussing them. One thing I would like to go over though is uh, some new things that were added for version 2 which is timing and performance. So you can see here you have a number of different uh, performance measures that you can now look at. For instance, let's see, the physics time step, the neural time step, complete time for the time step. So, so this is the, the actual amount of the real time required for each step of the uh, integration system and this is the portion of that step that's taken up by the physics engine, by the neural engine, by data charting, external stimuli and so on. So you can plot each of those separately to see where your simulation is spending its most amount of time. Another cool one is uh, real time versus sim time. So let's add this one here. change this to be one second and we can see this is very close to, to real time with this guy he's just slightly slower so if it was real time it would have a slope of one so at one second we would be at one second this is sim time this is real time uh, but it's slightly above that right here so one of the things you can do now is um, under simulation you can control this playback rate. Now of course uh, there's a you could set it to be the fastest possible and we can try that but it's not going to be any faster for this one. I take that back. <laughs> so if we set this one to be fast as possible you can see that in one second of sim time it was able to do that in only less than 0.4 seconds of real time. So we can set this back to match physics or if since it was slightly off what we could do is use a preset value and I think we've changed this is a one millisecond time step so let's go with 0 0.9 it's slightly too fast 0 0.98 that's much closer That's about probably as close as we're going to get. So now, by you know adjusting this, you can control this more precisely to try and get uh, things in real time based on you know how many um, neurons and things you have actually running and how long it takes to do those. But you can also use this to slow the simulation playback down. So let's say we want to set this to three three milliseconds. Now we can make it the simulation playback go really slow, even though the the time step itself is the same. So this gives you independent control of the playback rate and the integration time steps so that they're not interlinked. And that's actually a really useful feature too. And you can see if it took for one second, it took almost three uh, seconds to do that simulation. So one other feature of this that I would like to, to just briefly discuss. Let's go ahead and open up the neural subsystem again. 
Add a firing rate neuron. Add a stimulus. We use a tonic current stimulus. From zero to five, ten nanoamps. Let's add a new axis. And with the firing frequency for this time, and let's change this to be two seconds just to give us more response time. Oh, uh, <laughs> let's change it so it's not doing that anymore. Uh, let's just go as fast as possible. Well, no, let's, let's match physics. Okay. We can see that because of that uh, stimulus that put in, we go up to one uh, firing frequency of one fairly quickly. So one of the things we can do now, though, let's run it and pause. So we're at 0.4 seconds, 0.411. Let's select this guy. Let's change our gain while the simulation is paused from 10 to 1. and let our simulation continue running. And what you can see is that we changed that as the simulation was going and that changed it dynamically so that it went from 1 to 0 0.1 because we changed our gain from 10 to 1 uh, by a factor of 10 so that immediately dropped. So you can make changes to the neurons as the simulation is ongoing it's got to be paused. You can't make changes while it's actually running. You have to pause it and make changes and then run it again. But uh, you, know, you can do that dynamically now, whereas you could not do that before with Animat Lab. Finally, one other little thing that was really kind of annoying in version 1 was that you couldn't set this background color. It was always black. Uh, within version 2, you can now change this to whatever you want it to be. So you just go to the environment variable and background color, and then you can change it to be pretty much anything you want. And it gives, again, it gives you just more control over the graphical look of how things are set up so that you can make it do whatever you want it to do. So those are the major major changes to the user interface for version one, or, uh, for version two. I plan on adding you know more features and uh, newer and some new stuff as I go on, but this is kind of where it is right now. This is at the beta version right now that's being released, but this video tutorial will probably continue to be used even once it's released to the full version. I don't expect the user interface or other things to change significantly. They're pretty pretty well set. So uh, I hope this helps everybody, and I look forward to seeing what you guys can build with Animal Lab. Thanks.